Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to the last and final module. This is module 12 and we will cover the remaining part of metabolic diversity. So this is part 4 of metabolic diversity, lecture 59 of module 12. So in this lecture we are going to look at some other alternative electron acceptors. We will take a look at iron, manganese, um, several other heavy metals, organic compounds, all of these uh, can serve as electron acceptors and we will look at uh, the bacteria that are capable of utilizing them. In terms of hydrocarbon oxidation, uh, we have different metabolic pathways for organic acids, for fats and sugars. So, we will take a look at that as well and finally, we will end this particular uh, lecture with aromatic compounds. How are they biodegraded under aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions? So here we have a table which shows several other electron acceptors. If you remember back from the uh, three biochemical pathways, we have either fermentation or respiration and within respiration we have aerobic respiration which means the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen and we have anaerobic respiration which means that the terminal electron acceptor is any other compound other than oxygen. So here we have chlorate. Chlorate is formed when chlorine gas or hypochlorite ion are added to water then you get chlorate it can serve as an electron acceptor you may have manganese in the environment if it is present as mn4 plus which it often is it can be reduced to mn2 plus then you have selenate it can be reduced and it can serve as an electron acceptor Ferric iron Fe3 plus can be reduced to Fe2 plus which happens under anaerobic conditions. Dimethyl sulfoxide DMSO can be converted to dimethyl sulfide, yes, uh, dimethyl sulfide and arsenate can be converted to arsenide. TMAO trimethylamine N oxide can be converted to trimethylamine. Fumarate can be converted to succinate. Let's take a look at some specific uh, reactions and the bacteria that are involved in these reactions. So we have ferric iron as the electron acceptor in this case. Ferric iron can be reduced by a, a large number of autotrophic as well as heterotrophic bacteria. It can be coupled to the oxidation of inorganic as well as organic compounds. Even aromatic compounds can serve as electron donors. It is one of the major forms of anaerobic respiration. Some of the common species are Shivanella, Putrefaciens, Geobacter, Geospiralum, Geovibrio. And this is one example of the oxidation of acetate in combination with the reduction of ferric iron by Geobacter. So acetate plus ferric iron plus water will be acetate will be converted to carbon bicarbonate and ferric iron will be converted to ferrous iron. This is an energy yielding reaction. The delta G value is fairly high which means the cell yield is also likely to be fairly high. Geobacter can also use hydrogen and other organic electron donors including aromatic compounds like toluene. Uh, toluene, benzene, toluene, xylene, these are very common petroleum based compounds that are found around uh, petrol pumps and other petroleum uh, utilizing areas where the tanks may have leaks. What is the environmental significance of this? So, in situ bioremediation of toluene is possible by these organisms to clean up accidental 
spills. So let's say you have oil refineries, you have petrol pumps, you have several other areas where petroleum is stored in tanks. If these tanks start leaking, either because of an accident or uh, just slow corrosion and so on, that can be remediated by using these particular organisms. We have manganese and other inorganic substances as electron acceptors. So you have Mn4 plus and Mn2 plus. These are stable and biologically relevant nutrients. The anoxic reduction of Mn4 plus is possible. Uh, Mn4 plus and Mn2 plus is carried out by chemoorganotrophs. So chlorate is another example. I've already shown you that it has an easy value of 1.03 volts. It's more electropositive than oxygen, uh, which has an uh, E value of 0.82 volts. So it's a far superior electron acceptor. Chlorate res reducing bacteria have been isolated. They are facultative aerobes. There may be an issue about toxicity, which I am not sure about. Acetate and other non-fermentable carbon sources can be oxidized with manganese 4 as the electron acceptor. So these are examples of bacteria that are capable of mediating both these reactions with manganese as well as chlorate. So Shivanella, putrefacients and other bacteria can mediate these reactions. Let's take a look at heavy metals like sel uh, selenium and arsenic. These are uh, arsenic is considered to be a toxic heavy metal. Some people think that selenium is also a toxic heavy metal, but there is some uh, evidence in the literature that it may be a trace nutrient as well. Uh, so regardless of whether it's completely toxic or uh, toxic only at certain concentrations, let's just take a look at these two common toxic heavy metals that are found in the environment. Both of them are capable of supporting anoxic bacterial growth. Now, if they are capable of supporting anoxic bacterial growth, that means if you have contamination of water, soil with these elements, then bioremediation is a possibility. So if you have selenate, it can be converted to selenite or to elemental selenium, which is the least toxic form of selenium. And you also have a sulfate reducing bacteria, desulfotomaculum. So arsenate can be converted to arsenite and then a complex of AS2S3. And these, uh, this AS2S3 precipitates spontaneously. So this is what we have, arsenic trisulfide, um, which, has, which is the reduction of arsenate by a sulfate reducing bacterium. Um, so you can see this is the culture after uh, it has been incubated and inoculated with this particular bacterium, desulfotomaculum. And uh, the yellow material are uh, precipitates of AS2S3, so arsenic trisulfide. Uh, the process is called biomineralization or biotransformation. We do not use the word biodegradation for the transformation of metals from one oxidation state to another. Please refer to figure 17.48 in Brock's Biology of Microorganisms, 10th edition. So coming back to uh, this conversion of arsenate to arsenite, AS2S3 can be used as a method of detoxification. The mineral can be formed both intracellularly as well as extracellularly. Detoxification is possible for contaminated sites including water as well as soil. Then we come to organic electron acceptors. So organic electron acceptors can be fumarate or some of the others that are shown in the table that I showed you previously. Uh, fumarate and succinate are intermediates in the tricarboxylic acid cycle and the fumarate succinate can be coupled with NADH or hydrogen oxidation. Energy yield is sufficient for generating 1 ATP. Many different bacterial species are capable of utilizing them and this is uh, also the basis of um, fermentation reactions. 
uh, many uh, species, like I said, are capable of carrying out this reaction. There are other organic electron acceptors like DMSO, TMAO, and um, I, I think I mentioned in previous lectures that when you go to the seaside, there is a typical fishy smell, and that fishy smell is associated with DMSO and DMS. Both of them are natural compounds in marine and freshwater environments. You can also have halogenated compounds. Now, if you have an al halogenated compounds, one of the biggest problem with these compounds is that the halo when it is when an organic compound is uh, associated with an with a halogen, it's typically highly resistant to bacterial degradation. The first step that is necessary for biodegradation to happen is reductive dechlorination. So, in the first case these halogenated compounds can serve as an electron acceptor in anaerobic respiration. Electron donors like hydrogen and other organic compounds can be coupled with this reaction. So, here you have chlorobenzoate. So, the first thing for further degradation to happen is that chlorobenzoate is converted to benzoate and HCl is removed. So, once this first step is taken care of, then benzoate can be degraded like any other organic compound. Uh, most bacterial species can do the above. They need acclimation and halogenated compounds are generally toxic to fish and other organisms. So, we have uh, several examples of reductive dechlorination over here. You can have several different electron donors. The, these are examples from the literature where you have different combinations of electron donors and acceptors. So, you have hydrogen coupled with trichloroethylene, tetrachloroethylene. You have hydrogen, formate, pyruvate, lactate, benzoate and in combination with different organic compounds. And you can see here that there are specific species that can mediate a specific coupling of the electron donors and acceptors. Then what are the products? What are the end products of these reactions? The end products, for example, of the reduction of tetrachloroethylene is dichloroethylene or trichloroethylene or all the way to ethene. Um, there are several other uh, points that are mentioned here. I am just going to allow you to go through them. One thing that we have already realized is that oxygen can serve as the terminal electron acceptor and it can be combined with electron donors like hydrocarbons. So, any organic compound can suffice and hydrocarbons are just as good a carbon source. So, in this case oxygen becomes a direct re reactant in catabolic as well as anabolic reactions. In aerobic processes this oxidation is catalyzed by various enzymes. So, there are two uh, categories of enzymes monooxygenases or hydroxyl uh, again hydroxylases uh, which transfer only one oxygen or they form an OH group and you have dioxygenase which transfers both atoms of oxygen in molecular oxygen. So, these are the two uh, groups of enzymes that are responsible for the oxidation of hydrocarbons. You can have oxidation of hydrocarbons of both aliphatic as well as aromatic uh, compounds and both of them can be degraded aerobically as well as anaerobically by bacteria, molds and yeast. Saturated hydrocarbons are generally oxidized at their terminal carbon. Let me just show you an example of that. So, here we have N-octane which is an aliphatic hydrocarbon and you have a monooxygenase enzyme. So, this monooxygenase enzyme in the presence of oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor will convert N-octane to N-octanol and NADH will be converted to NAD plus and water is formed. This NAD plus is converted back to NADH and you get N octanal. Okay. And then you have various other steps in the process going to the beta oxidation of N octanoic acid where uh, this particular compound will combine with acetyl-CoA 
so and in this process 1 ATP is going to be utilized and 2 uh, NADH have been uh, generated while 1 NADH was invested. So this is saturated hydrocarbons in the presence of oxygen. Unsaturated hydrocarbons contain a terminal double bond. They can also be oxidized. Uh, so this is, so supposing the starting point were an unsaturated hydrocarbon that can also be oxidized. There are key intermediates in the oxidation of aromatic compounds. These are generally protocatechuate and catechol. So these intermediates have to be converted to intermediates of the tricarboxylic acid cycle like succinate, acetyl-CoA and pyruvate. Benzene in the presence of benzene mono monooxygenase will be converted to benzene epoxide, benzene diol and then catechol. Now this catechol is a key intermediate. It will be further converted by a dioxygenase and remember one of the first things for an aromatic compound to be further biodegraded is that the ring has to be broken. So, the, uh, so if we were to put it in a very simplistic way, benzene gets converted to catechol and then catechol has to be converted to a, uh, the ring has to be broken and that ring is broken at this stage, dioxygenase is converted to cis-cis muconate. You can have toluene as the starting compound. This toluene is first converted by dioxygenase, tol toluene dioxygenase is going to convert it in a series of reactions and eventually you will get methyl catechol and that will be further catalyzed to uh, the same compound. Um, I think this is methyl cis muconate. So uh, these intermediates like I said have to be converted to intermediates of the TCA cycle like succinate, acetyl-CoA and pyruvate. So that's the whole point about all these key intermediates is that no matter what your starting compound is, first it gets converted to the key intermediate and then through the normal um, reaction series, it will be either completely mineralized or converted to other intermediates. So here we have the example of benzoate. It has been joined by CoA enzyme. 1 ATP has been utilized, benzoyl CoA has been formed, protons have been picked up and in the entire process pimelyl CoA has been formed and then that enters the beta oxidation pathway where the end point is going to be acetate plus CO2. Then we come to organic acids. Organic acid metabolism, all intermediates of the tricarboxylic acid cycle are found in the environment. That's why we know that they are common intermediates. They are also fermentation products of microbial growth. So under aerobic conditions, C4, C5, C6 acids can be brought into the TCA cycle. Remember that all the TCA intermediates are C4, 5 and 6. And ATP can be formed by oxidative phosphorylation. Under anaerobic conditions, these acids, C4, C5, C6 acids can be converted to pyruvate and then to acetate and ATP is formed by substrate level phosphorylation. SLP stands for substrate level phosphorylation. In terms of lipids and fatty acids, we know we all like eating fatty foods and uh, we all know that they are a good source of energy. and even though they may be a problem in terms of diet control and so on, but they are excellent substrates. They are highly biodegradable and serve as good substrates, not just for human beings, but for microorganisms as well. So lipases can break down fats into their components of glycerol and fatty acids. So we have phospholipases which hydrolyze phospholipids, Okay, so what we see here in the first case is the action of a lipase enzyme on a simple lipid or a triglyceride. So you have the triglyceride molecule and the enzyme can cut um, the bond over here where the arrow is shown at all three positions. Uh, so you can turn to figure 17.66 and 17.67 in Brock's Biology 10th edition uh, for um, 
a photograph that shows you or rather a micrograph that shows you uh, the action, uh, the impact of the action of phospholipase on egg yolk. So this uh, micrograph shows you an example of the action of phospholipase. So when an inhibitor was added along with the presence of phospholipase which is present in egg yolk, uh, because of the presence of phospholipase, the fatty acids led to precipitation of the egg yolk which you can see over here. And in the other case, because an inhibitor was added, so there was no phospholipase reaction and therefore no precipitation of the egg yolk. So, uh, in uh, aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions, these lipases will uh, break down lipids and fatty acids. Now, how are fatty acids metabolized? So, there is a particular pathway for the metabolism of fatty acids and it's called the beta oxidation pathway. In this particular pathway, um, two carbons of the fatty acid are split in a series of reactions. So the process keeps repeating itself until the fatty acid is completely uh, me uh, metabolized. So one, it's a step by step two carbons at a time. Now remember acetyl is a two carbon C2 compound. So these two carbons of the first step in the fatty acid uh, metabolism will associate with coenzyme A that is the activation of the coenzyme A and that will release acetyl-CoA. So here you have a fatty acid and you can see coenzyme A is being added at the terminal end and two carbons are taken up uh, with the acetyl with CoA and in that process ATP is being utilized and um, in the next step, you have the formation of the double bond, addition of the hydroxyl and so on. I'm not, like I said, going to go into any of these details. I think it's far beyond the scope of our course. So uh, this acetyl-CoA, remember, is a key intermediate in the TCA cycle, the tricarboxylic cycle or the glyoxylate cycle. These are examples of C5 and C6 sugars that can be used by various enzymes and uh, serve as energy as well as carbon sources. So you have cellulose, starch, glycogen, agar, chitin, pectin, dextran, sucrose, lactose, the list just goes on and on, there's no end to it. And you can see the specific catabolic enzymes that are needed to break down these polymeric molecules into uh, smaller and simpler forms. So cellulose, I've already given you explain, um, examples of starch versus cellulose and glycogen. These examples were shown in a previous topic. And then you have so many other examples. And all enzymes tend to be specific for the substrate that they are breaking down. Okay, so here you can see agar which comes from marine algae, rhodophyta. The catab uh, catabolic enzymes are agarase. Then you have chitin. Chitin comes from the cell walls of certain specific fungi or it's part of the exoskeletons of insects and uh, the enzyme that uh, helps to break down chitin is chitinase. In case of pectin, pectin comes from plants, the leaves and seeds of plants and the enzyme that uh, breaks it down is called pectinase. Uh, dextran which is a polymer of sugar or glucose and is part of the capsules or slime layers of the bacteria can be broken down by an enzyme called dextranase. Xylan which is present in uh, xylose and other sugars, it comes from plants and the enzymes that break it down are called xylanases. Sucrose is a very common sugar. It's a disaccharide. It's a glucose fructose disaccharide. It comes from plants, basically fruits and vegetables. And the enzyme that breaks it down is called invertase. So lactose, which is another disaccharide, it comes from milk. It's made of glucose and galactose. And the enzyme that breaks it down is called beta-galactosidase. 
So if we look at C5, C6 and polysaccharide utilization, we know that cellulose and starch are major components of cell walls, capsules, slimes and storage products. Cellulose tends to be less soluble. Starch is completely soluble in water. Cellulose is not um, as soluble in water as starch and it's much e uh, more difficult to digest. Fungi and bacteria both are capable of digesting both cellulose as well as starch. I've shown you examples of that in the past. Bacterial species like Cytophaga, Sporocytophaga, Actinomycetes, Clostridia, all these are examples of bacterial species and fungal species that can digest both cellulose and starch. Starch uh, digesting enzymes include amylases. So they have several applications in textile, laundry, paper and food industry. You can see a cellulose digesting bacteria that has attached itself to a cellulose fiber in this scanning electron micrograph. So sporocytophaga is the species and that is what you see over here. These are the fibers. Uh, these extracellular polysaccharides can be broken down into their monomeric units by hydrolysis and these enzymes are mediating that reaction. The storage products can be further broken down by phosphorolysis. So if you have substrate level phosphorylation, glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate and glucose 1-phosphate using inorganic phosphorus, not using an ATP unlike the glycolysis step. So this is a energy savings reaction for the cell. We also have another set of reactions that are possible. Now we know that in the environment you can have C1 to Cn organic compounds. So let's start with C1. Now if you have C1 compounds, C1 compounds can be methane, methanol or any other uh, compound, formaldehyde, carbon dioxide and so on. So methanotrophy and methylotrophy has been observed uh, by various species. I will not go into any details. I think it's beyond the scope of what we are doing here. But there are heterotrophic species which can utilize C1 hydrocarbons like methane, methyl, uh, methanol and um, methyl groups for both energy as well as biosynthesis. And methanotrophs type 1 and type 2 um, are cap these are the two pathways by which methanotrophs, methanotrophs means bacteria that are utilizing methane or methanol as their substrate. So ribulose monophosphate pathway and the serine pathway are utilizable. Thank you and I will stop at this point.